What makes movement good? When we look at someone who moves well, there's something deeply satisfying about it. The smoothness of the transition, the powerful dynamic of it. It's like anything done well. It just works. And it's something that nearly all people who do any type of movement pursue. We all want to be able to move like this. But what is good movement fundamentally? And if we don't do it already, how do we go about acquiring it? I'm going to use Travis Verkey throughout this video as an example, mostly just because he's really good at moving and I like analyzing his footage. To understand this idea, we need to build a conceptual framework and I'm going to introduce a few new ideas. So first and most importantly, connection. Connection refers to the transitions between movements and not just big movements, but small movements too. The transition between lifting your arm up and down and between doing a jump and the next one. And the result of moving with good connection is things being where they need to be, when they need to be there, with no loss of power, speed, balance, or connection along the way. And Travis is very, very good at moving in a connected way. The transitions between his movements are seamless. He doesn't lose anything as he moves from one position to the next. Most people lose things as they move. They lose power, balance, stability, control. The movements often look jerky or slightly awkward. And people often look like they're falling or just gravity is taking over and they're no longer really in control of their position in space. These gaps, these moments between movements, both small and large, are called holes and they're the antithesis of connection. They're almost easier to describe than connection itself. The more holes you have, the less good your movement is, both experientially, practically and visually. I'm showing clips of myself now in the past, but everyone knows what this looks like. Movement without connection is just ugly, and the movement results are underwhelming, to say the least. There are many different types of holes, but they're all caused by the same fundamental underlying factors, which are your position and your support. Position is where your body is at any given point in time, and support is how you are supporting that position. Position matters because everything in your body weighs something, your arms and your head, they're, they're heavy. And if these things are just flailing around uncontrolled, they act like dead weights pulling you around. And also because your muscles have a preferred working range. When you contract your muscles, your muscle fibers overlap. And if they're really overlapped, which means the muscles really short, they aren't very strong. But similarly, if the muscles are really not overlapped, really far apart, and the muscles are really long, they're also not very strong. All muscles have slightly different ideal power ranges, but that's usually about halfway. So your joint position influences that. If your joint's really open, your muscles are long, or if your joint's really closed, your muscles are short. Being about halfway is ideal for strength and power. And then also generally in terms of support, which muscles are supporting you and when and how strongly each is working. This matters because gravity is on 24 seven. You have to be supporting your position somehow, but also because different muscles are differently good at doing different jobs. For instance, if you're picking up a really heavy weight off the ground, you could do this through just your low back muscles, but they aren't really suited to that particular task. It'd be much better to use the glutes and powerful muscles around your hips to do this lifting. And ultimately, these other muscles are just better suited to doing that task anyway, through their larger size and through their better position, forming more advantageous levers for doing that task. So as you can see already, both position and support are linked concepts, and they're constantly interacting to form either fantastic, beautiful, fluid movement or movement filled with holes. So for an example of a hole, I want you to think about what happens to your head when you land a jump. Your head is a weight. And the further it moves away from your center of mass, the more support is required to hold the weight of the head. You'll basically need greater total support than if it were on top of you more. But because of the position you're now in, it's also going to disadvantage muscles. So in this position, your cervical spine muscles are going to end up shorter. And when they're shorter, it means they don't like to work. And your thoracic spine muscles are going to end up longer, which is also going to make them harder to work. So you need both of these muscles to hold up your head, but it's going to be harder for them both to work because of the position of the head. Another example of a common hole is when the wrong support is used at the wrong time. So you'll often see people like stick a precision jump. And then as they go to stand up, they'll lose balance and fall over backwards. What is happening here? Similar to the lifting example, where they should have been pushing themselves to upright through their glutes and their abs through a straight spine. Instead, they're getting upright through arching through the low back using their back extensor muscles. And this is a way of getting upright, but it comes with a lot of disadvantages. Without the support of the glutes and the abs, 
gravity then acts unopposed on the weight of the torso, which is now traveling backwards, and acts to pull the person back off the ledge they just landed on. For beautiful and fluid movement, we need position and support to work together as a team. When Verky transitions through these movements, you can see that his head, neck, and torso are all relatively straight, but the angle that they're all on is all quite forwards. This is keeping his center of gravity forwards, but still maintaining the uprightness and connected through all those muscles in his spine. This is the ideal and it then goes on to allow his posterior chain muscles to work well because of his forward center of gravity and it makes the transitions between each of these movements so smooth and seamless. If his head was collapsing or his torso was collapsing or his center of gravity was back, none of this would be possible. And thus his momentum is near continuous. There's almost no transition time between each of these movements and he never has to stop and find things. Finding is the sensation of trying to reconnect after connection has been lost. And this can be balance or support, momentum, power. It's that sensation of, ah, I had it there a moment ago, where's it gone? Some common examples of this are when you're doing plyos and you land and your arms are just somewhere and they're certainly not in the place where you need them to jump again. So you have to reset them back to a new position so you can swing them again. Think Jesse LaFleur, sorry, Jesse. I or having to pick the weight of your head and torso up again after landing a, a jump as you try and transition between the next thing. You can't move from there, you have to reset, find them again. The best athletes really have to find anything because they never lost it. Connection was consistent throughout the whole movement. And basically anyone who's really good at movement maintains great connection through everything they're doing. And people have strengths and weaknesses still. For instance, Verky may not be as good at overhead arm connection as someone like Tim Champion, but he's still really good, especially at the things that he does well. Now let's think further about how Travis and others move their body parts. When we think about an arm, you know, lifted out to the side, this can get down in two ways. Either gravity can act on the mass of this arm, pulling it down, completely unopposed, or I can pull this arm down. And the fact is gravity never turns off. It's inevitably part of all movements. So really we have three choices. We can either let gravity take over, we can work with gravity to pull it down, or we can resist gravity, keeping the arm where it is. These three variations are all super important and constitute a large part of holes and movement. And there is a similar component, which is also very related, which is momentum. So if you throw any part of your body, once it's traveling, it will keep traveling. So imagine throwing your arms for a jump. Once those arms are traveling up, you can do the same three things to them. You can resist them, you can leave them, or you can help them. And where things really become problematic is when we let gravity or momentum completely take over the movement and we don't control the position anymore. This is bad because it's very imprecise. We aren't choosing where it's going anymore. We're letting other things beyond our body decide where the thing is going to end up. And this is inevitably going to cause positioning errors. Things won't get put where they need to be for the movement to happen successfully. But not only that, when we arrive at the position, whatever that position happened to be, we won't be in control of the limb. It'll just kind of be there without any muscles to control or support its new position. And moving it again is going to be really hard because we have to re-recruit all the appropriate muscle groups. We have to find things again before we're able to move again. In terms of working with gravity, this is also really important. When an arm is moving somewhere, let's say it's falling down behind us and we're about to do a standing jump. If we just let it fall, we're wasting potential power generation opportunity. If we pull it down and add to that movement, we're increasing our ground reaction forces and the potential force we can generate for that jump. Sometimes we want to add to gravity, but in other situations, we want to oppose it. So back to the landing example again, if we're landing and our head is falling forward unopposed, this is gonna make the movement not work well. We need to oppose that using the support muscles in the back of our spine and neck. Now, at this point in the explanation, what people often think that I've said is, I get it, let me just squeeze all my muscles really hard all the time. And that is unequivocally not what I'm saying. Doing this indiscriminately is not what we're looking for. We're looking for control and whatever ultimately is appropriate for the movement we're doing. So for instance, if we're trying to do a dyno, just tensing all of our shoulder muscles as hard as we can isn't going to make that any easier. But similarly, just letting them all go soft and floppy isn't correct either. We need to do whatever is required for the movement. And what's really unfortunate about this is that it requires using our brains. We have to think about what is needed and then do that. 
So, for example, we're entering a flip. We want as much general flexion as possible. We want our body to get as small as we can so our rotation speeds up and it's easier to do that. But we also need to be able to leave that flex position, which means extending again. If, when we entered that flex position, we lost control of our extensors, the muscles that work to pull us out of that position, if they aren't on anymore, we have to go and find them again. And we aren't really in control of our position, and getting back out of it can be super hard. And this really happens in any flexion movement. If we think about doing pliers, for instance, our hips are going to close and our glutes are going to get longer. And it's harder for them to work because positionally they're getting longer and weaker as they get longer. But we still need to keep that onness, that eccentric loading through them so that when we land, they're immediately ready to go and fire as we do to the next movement. And this is very similar to what happens when people often reach out for a jump. As people reach their leg in front of them, the momentum of the leg swinging up kind of takes over and they lose the support of the eccentric muscles, the glutes on the back of that, and they, they aren't there when they need them for landing that jump. So in these examples, we're mostly talking about gravity moving body parts without the appropriate muscular assistance, whether it be support or inhibition. But there's also another side to this, which is keeping the body or body parts in the wrong position and trying to compensate for that wrong position with additional muscular effort. And this most commonly shows up in walking, running, jumping, all those types of movements. If people's center of gravity is too far back, gravity is literally taking them backwards. And no amount of muscular effort, no matter how hard you squeeze your leg muscles, are you able to overcome the power of gravity. At least not completely. It's just really inefficient. You want them to be going in the same direction, working towards the same goal. If our position is not ideal, more muscular effort is not the answer. It's why some of the best athletes are not necessarily extremely muscular, but rather are in extremely good positions. And Travis does this so well in transitions. He keeps his center of gravity forward without collapsing to get there. This forwardness allows his posterior chain muscles to work additively. And this is why so many of his transitions look so good. Now, things are about to get a little bit spicy because I'm going to introduce something I've been avoiding, which is the fact that this isn't just a forward and back interaction. This is also a left and right interaction. So if you start to get overwhelmed or confused, just start to panic. Okay, that probably won't help. Maybe just watch the video in full from start to finish like three or four times. That'll definitely help. Okay, fundamentally walking is about getting from one foot to the other. And there's two ways you can get weight from one foot to the other. You can get it there muscularly or you can get it there positionally. So muscularly means you squeeze some of your muscles to get there. You push yourself with your leg muscles to get onto the other leg. And positionally means you move something to get over there. So it could be throwing an arm or rocking your torso to the side or any positional adjustment that takes more of your weight that way. These aren't exactly separable, but people do have distinct preferences. Most people tend to get onto one foot with much more muscular effort and the other with much more positional and gravitational effect. So this can be a little clearer if we use an example. So we can see here, I'm getting onto my left foot through position. I'm rocking my torso over to the left and this is taking my weight across onto that left foot. But then when I get back onto my right foot, this is mostly through muscular effort on that left leg, pushing myself back onto that right foot. And this goes on to cause widespread general non-specific holes in people's movements because People habitually have a way they prefer to do this on one foot and the other, but we need to be able to do both. This is really important when it comes to maintaining balance and movements in particular, because if we're only really good at controlling balance on one side through a weight shift and the other through muscular effort, we're limiting our movement potential and possibilities so much. And this hypothetical person here is going to have so many problems with maintaining balance. They're always going to be falling the same way. And most people are like this. We have our preferred falling sides. Maybe 70% of the time, people are going to fall the same direction for basically the same underlying reasons. These general patterns are so ubiquitous and consistent. They show up in all the movements we do. And these are kind of the general widespread holes that come from this positional and support and balance. Ideally, I don't think we'd really lose balance at all. The best athletes really do, or much less so than the average person. Most of this is just about bad connection, facilitated by habitual uneven support and position. And this left and right thing applies to torsos much more generally. We need the ability to move left and right in our spine, but this freedom comes with problems. Most people habitually sit with passive bend one way in their spine, either at the bottom or the top or both. This passive bend results in a whole bunch of problems because 
Fundamentally, we're shortening a whole bunch of muscles and lengthening others. This is disadvantaging them because muscles don't like being short and they don't like being long. They want to be in the mid range so they have their ideal muscle length for activation and whatever movement you're going to do. Similarly, this change in position also causes a lot of problems with weight. Things in your body weigh stuff and if you have more weight now over this side, this arm gets relatively heavier and something needs to hold onto it. And so muscles that shouldn't end up working all the time, end up working all the time and perhaps in disadvantaged positions. So maybe your rhomboid, the muscle between your shoulder blade ends up short and then holding onto the weight of your arm all the time. This is something that's really common and this causes problems for those muscles, not just passively, but when you go to do any movement, those muscles are already recruited, already doing a job they were never supposed to be doing because of your position and you can't recruit them when you need to. Say for instance, you have to dynamically move your shoulder blades back. If they're already pulling back, holding something they shouldn't be, it's much harder for them to do their job. And really any movement that has left and right elements, which is everything, is going to be disadvantaged by this because half of your muscles are ending up short and half along, even if slightly, and that's causing them to have less than ideal functioning. And then as you go to move the extra weights that they're holding and making things harder. So maintaining a central position is one of the ways you can stop persistent holes ending up in your movement from your passive torso shape. And so when we look back to Verki again, we can see what this looks like when it's done very well, although not perfectly, but that's another video. He's really good at keeping himself in center. In most joints, in most of his body, most of the time, he is in the ideal or pretty close to ideal position with the ideal support for what it is that he's trying to do at that given moment. Okay, so that's about 10 billion tons of context. How do you go about applying this for yourself? That has three steps. One, Notice what is happening in your body as you move. Two, understand what that feels like, what that means. And three, patiently and persistently train your central nervous system to do something different. Okay, let's expand on that a little more. I want you to try and look at yourself like you're looking at a stranger, like you just don't know who this person is, and look at what looks good or wrong about their movement. Then once you've got some idea, see if your subjective felt sensations match with that visual awkwardness or wrongness. Here are some common examples to look for. Flexion, crouching in, making yourself smaller. One of the hardest things about parkour is how much flexion it requires. Not just that it needs flexion, but that you need to leave flexion after you've gone there. This means maintaining the eccentric support of all of your extensor muscles across your body so that when you get into that position, you're able to dynamically, powerfully, with control, leave it. Another general area that I see a lot of problems in is arm movements. When you move your arms around, are they moving because you're putting them places or are they essentially just acting like two medieval flails? This is again me from the past, but this is what two flail arms look and feel like. They don't add anything to the movement. All they're doing is acting like dead weights, constantly pulling you off balance. When you move your arms places, are you in control of your position? Are you contracting the muscles? Are you deciding where you're going or are they just going where they're being taken? And another two of the ones I went into a bit more detail in, which is the passive torso length imbalances and just the weight shift, how you're getting between your right and your left foot. And generally, in terms of modeling good movement, it's really helpful to look at people who do those things well and try and do it like them. Like, look at the best athletes and really think about how they're making the shapes they are and try and imagine how they're supporting those shapes as well. And really try and compare what you're seeing with what you see in your own movement and feel the differences between the two. Now, in terms of changing these things, the more context you can practice them in, the better. These are not things that just show up in parkour movements only. These are patterns that are showing up in everything everyone is doing. And success in changing them is much more about repetitions than it is about getting muscles stronger. These are patterns. These are the way you use your body. And these are things that are dictated mostly by your central nervous system, the way it's wired. And the way you change wiring is just by doing something different a whole bunch of times in a whole bunch of different contexts. Occasionally doing 10 minutes dedicated practice is good, but if you can try and integrate these things into as many different aspects of the way you move, the better the results are going to be and the more ingrained they'll be in the fundamental way you move your body. And also generally speaking, if you have a great idea about movement and you think, oh, I've got this all worked out and when you try and do it, the movement results suck. That is an indication that your idea is probably either wrong or limited in some fundamental way. Don't just get hung up on thinking you're doing it right. Really look at the results that you get when you're trying to apply things. If you're getting better movement results, that's a really good indication you're on the right path. If you have, think that you're doing things better, but your movement's actually worse, you're doing things worse. 
Reality doesn't really care about what you think you're doing. It's just what you're actually doing. So don't overthink this stuff too much. Use it as a conceptual framework to build off, but ultimately this has to come back to the physical felt sensations in your body as you move and the results you get moving. And yeah, just to reiterate, connection is not just tensing everything and hoping for the best. It's much more than that. It's much more nuanced. You know, previously, when I was moving, I felt like two arms, two legs, a torso, and a head. These things had no real relationship to each other. They need to be one unified thing working towards a common goal with everything in its right place at the right time, but not rushed and not slow either. So in closing, will moving better make you less injured? And the answer is yes and no. Yes, in that doing movements that others and you previously would have considered hard will be fine for you and you won't get injured. them. And the things that you considered hard before will now be easy and you won't get injured on them. But in terms of overall, the answer would probably be no. And that is because you'll inevitably be doing harder things and your limits will be higher and the consequences for making a mistake will be higher. So traveling back in time again, here's me doing a cat pass that previously I would have found literally impossible. It just would have destroyed me. Everything would have hurt. I couldn't have landed it. It just wouldn't work. Now I can do it, but the risk for error is much higher. If I make a mistake, just a small mistake, the consequences are much higher because we're dealing with much higher forces. But having higher limits is pretty cool. So I'd say go for it anyway. And now to briefly interrupt today's video with an exciting message from our sponsor this week. Me. It's fine. Don't worry about it. If you would like help with your biomechanics, posture, or anything else that I talk about in this or previous videos, you can contact me online at theotanchek.com and you can work with me as a client. Anyway, back to the video guys. Also, final, final aside, in case you aren't aware, our Lord Verki has suffered a pretty severe ankle injury and is going to be out for a long time. So he wants money to pay for surgery and stuff like that, and you should give it to him. I've put his PayPal down in the link below, so if you want to help him out, you can give him some money for things. Uh, yeah, also sorry for the really big delay on this video. I do plan on making more content, but that's probably going to be closer to the end of this year because I'm still a very busy person. But yeah, thanks a lot for watching. I appreciate the ongoing support. I guess you guys are the best. Peace out.